Well, if you have your Bible, you open it to James chapter 5. James chapter 5 is where we'll be today. Uh, as you're turning there, I just want to say that the providence of, of God in expository preaching, which is where we just pick a book and we go verse by verse through it. Uh, I am never disappointed by how the Lord orders His Word and what falls on what weeks and how it applies uh, so faithfully. The, the Word truly is living and active, amen, as Hebrews 4 says. After when he passed, the elder team chose to break from our series that I had begun on worship, and they elected to preach through the book of James. And today, 11 weeks from that day, uh, I stand here prepared to preach James chapter 5, verses 7 and 12, a text that is encouraging the dispersed Christians, largely Jewish Christians, to have immovable patience in suffering. It's really incredible. The Lord truly writes the best stories, doesn't He? He, he does. He orchestrates amazing things. And I, I have never attempted to preach under the weight of such suffering. I don't even know really how this is going to go. <laughs> But it is my eager expectation, it is my hope today to be able to edify you all, my brothers and my sisters, with God's Word today. Uh, the main point of today's passage, as I at least have written it out, is this, and you can encourage you to take notes today, I think it's going to be helpful, but if you've got your notes in front of you, you can write this down, a fixed a fixed gaze on eternity is the key to immovable patience in suffering. A fixed gaze on eternity is the key to immovable patience in suffering. This is what I believe James is teaching these Christians and us today. I believe he also lays out a blueprint through giving five commands to the people that we see in the passage today for how we also can develop, how we also can walk in immovable patience in our own lives. And I hope to show you those this morning. Um, I will go ahead and read them to you just so you're aware, and then we'll walk through each one of them in a moment. The first is to be patient. <laughs> the first command he gives is be patient. The second that he gives is establish your heart. The third, do not grumble. So you can go ahead and prepare your toes for that one. That's, that one's hard. Number four, consider your examples. And number five, do not swear. I'm excited to be in front of you today and to preach these things. Um, if you're able, would you please stand to your feet in honor of the reading of the Lord's Word? When I finish this reading, I'll say, this is the word of the Lord, and I would like for you to respond, thanks be to God. Let me read to you. James 5, verse 7 through 12. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no 
so that you may not fall under condemnation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are gathered together today to hear your word. Lord, would you open our hearts, open our minds. Lord, would you enlighten us by the power of your spirit today to see your word, to understand it, to believe it with all of our hearts. Lord, we come today, I come today with a heavy heart, uh, a heart that is simultaneously filled with joy. And I ask for your help this morning, Lord. Each time we open your word, Lord, we are dependent upon your spirit to speak to us. And so I ask that your spirit do what only he can do. Lord, I intend to plant, I intend to water today, but I am trusting you for the increase, Father. We pray these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. It's, it's been well documented through the, seri- uh, through the series, and as each man has taught so well, each elder, elder candidate has come and preached so faithfully, uh, that James is writing to a largely Jewish Christian audience. And they, these people are living in what was called the diaspora or the dispersion. They're outside of Jerusalem is all that means. Now, there, there's varying factors as to why they could be outside of Jerusalem. It could be that they settled there. Uh, it could be that they were forced out of Jerusalem during uh, the persecution of the early church. We're not really told why. But what we know is that they're scattered from their homeland. Uh, We know that they are suffering many trials because James has made a point throughout the letter to encourage them a lot in their trials, telling them things like, consider it all joy, my brothers, when trials and tribulations come upon you. In our text today, James is really picking up his encouragement for their trials after he has just addressed the sins of the wealthy unbelievers that Jasper mentioned last week. Those wealthy unbelievers were mistreating their employees, were robbing them, were starving them, literally. They were contributing to their suffering, for sure. And James wants these believers to develop immovable patience in suffering. Immovable patience in suffering. It it seems so unnatural, doesn't it? To think that I'm in my suffering and therefore I must just be patient in this. It really is unnatural. Typically, exercising immovable patience in the face of suffering is the last thing that we want to do. It's the last thing our heart desires. We would much rather our situation be changed in a moment. We would much rather be able to go back to when things were the way they were supposed to be. We want the situation to be made right immediately. And that's regardless of whatever situation you face. Brothers and sisters, my family and I have been hurled by the providence of God into the depths of the raging waters of suffering. And as with a lot of suffering, it came in an instant. There was no warning, there was no build up. Before we knew it, suffering was standing on our doorstep, knocking, and we were forced to open the door. And you all, by your love and your care for us, your love for my daughter, have been thrust into the waters as well. But I want you to know that I don't stand here naive 
I don't stand here arrogant enough to think that just my trial, my suffering is also your greatest suffering. I, I recognize that you all have your own sufferings. You all have your own trials. You all have the things that you've faced possibly in the past, maybe things you're going through immediately or things that you'll face in the future. But I do appreciate you being willing to weep with the weeping and to comfort those who are afflicted. It has meant so much to us. In the event of suffering of any kind, the, the key to making it through it all, this is what I'm, I'm being forced really to find out, but this is what we're finding out, is that through it all, that the, the only way to make it through it all, I should say, in a way that God will be glorified in you, is to endure your suffering with immovable patience. It's to be Job-like. So then we must ask the question that I think James is answering today. The question underneath the text is, how can we develop immovable patience in suffering? How can we be marked by this kind of patience, this kind of godly character? And James is just going to shoot straight like he has the whole letter. He's not going to beat around the bush. He's not going to sugarcoat it because the last thing you want in your suffering is a sugarcoated truth. You're ready in those moments for hard facts. You're ready in those moments to know exactly what you need to do and to commit yourself to it. And that's what James is doing here. And so he just begins with verse 7, be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. He goes on, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. So again, if you're taking notes, and I encourage you to do so, how can we develop immovable patience and suffering? Number one, be patient. Commit yourself to patience. The, part, the first command for developing immovable patience is be patient until the coming of the Lord. But James isn't, he, he isn't being, um, he isn't being rude. He isn't being forward with them. He's not neglecting their afflictions. He's dealt with their afflictions. Throughout this letter, he has talked to them about their afflictions, the things that have caused them. Some of it has come to them from outside of them. Some of them, he says, is because of their own, their own lustful nature, their selfish desires. Right? We've seen throughout the book that they're, they're backbiting one another. They're using their tongue for evil. James says in chapter 3, verse 10, that blessing and cursing come from the same tongue. My brothers and sisters, things should not be this way. And so he's acknowledged their afflictions. He's even encouraged them on how to get out of their afflictions. And so the afflictions that are caused by our sinfulness are a bit easier to deal with. But because typically, you can repent of your sin and turn and follow Christ, and, and things begin to be made right. Now, there's consequences, and there's a spider web of those that can come from that, but typically, if you've wronged a brother by your mouth, you can go to your brother and say, I was a fool. I recognize that. Will you forgive me? And your brother will offer forgiveness and you'll move on. You caused hurt, there's pain, there's those things, but you've moved on. But when suffering comes to you from outside of you, when suffering knocks at your doorstep and it's the kind of suffering that you didn't do, you couldn't prevent, you couldn't predict, when that kind of suffering comes to you, it requires patience. And patience is required in all suffering, 
but especially in the suffering that is outside of your immediate control. It requires patience. And so James has acknowledged their afflictions in the previous verses, and now he turns to direct their response. Be patient, brothers. Wait on the Lord. In other words, James is saying, bear your afflictions without mummering, which he's literally going to say in just a couple of verses. Bear your injuries without revenge. Wait on God. Even if you do not yet see Him, wait on God. Let your patience be lengthened out until it becomes long-suffering. Now, you and I, we don't like (laughs) long-suffering. This is a fruit of the Spirit we would rather not know. But yet, it is a fruit of the Spirit that you would become patient, or as the word literally means, long-suffering. That you would be able to suffer long. (laughs) That your suffering would be drawn out, but that you would be patient in it. Let your patience be lengthened out until it becomes long-suffering, James is saying. How can it become long-suffering? Because your gaze is fixed on the day of the Lord. Be patient, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Be patient, brothers, because there is a surety that lies ahead of you that will create in you long-suffering. Be patient in your suffering because What lies ahead is the redemption of your bodies, the redemption of your souls, the redemption of the world, the time when all things will be made right, the moment where weeping ceases, where death doesn't reign anymore, the moment where sin does not control you any longer, the moment where suffering ceases. Amen? So be patient until the coming of the Lord. Let it be lengthened out until it becomes long-suffering. We're we're pretty soft people these days. Patience for us typically just means we've yielded to the necessity of what we're going through. I guess I will bear this because what choice do I have, we might say. I guess I'm going to go through this because I couldn't change it anyway. Brothers and sisters, that is not patience. That is barely veiled grumbling. Biblical patience, the kind of patience that will get you through your suffering, through your affliction, is nothing less than a humble acceptance in the wisdom and the will of God. That kind of patience possesses a serrated edge, you might say, and that serrated edge of patience will cut right through the thick of suffering. Biblical patience does not say, I guess I will bear this because what choice do I have? Biblical patience says, this affliction has come to me according to God's perfect wisdom and will for my life. Therefore, I will hope in Him. The the kind of godly patience we must cultivate is the ability to bear our afflictions with an eye toward our future glorious reward. That nothing is wasted. Godly patience recognizes that nothing falls by the wayside. Nothing is wasted, especially not your sufferings. All of it, all of it is building for you an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. This is literally what Paul's encouraging the saints at Corinth with when he says, so we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. So everything is coming down around us. Our outer self, our bodies even, are wasting away. But inwardly, the Spirit of God is renewing us day by day. And he goes on to write, for this light momentary affliction, 
I know I've said this before, but Paul has in view your entire life when he says this light momentary affliction. He's not talking about some specific little moment. Now, how in the world can you say that a life of suffering, a life of affliction is light or momentary? Well, the only way you get there is when you consider what lies beyond, what lies ahead, waiting on the return of the Lord. And that's exactly what he ties it to. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, so we don't look at our sufferings. I don't look just simply to the loss of my daughter and the difficulty of holidays without her, the difficulty of waking up and sitting at my table, eating my breakfast, drinking my coffee, and wondering, is Winnie Kate going to come around the corner this morning? I can't look to what's seen. I have to look to the things that are unseen. For the things that are unseen, sorry, the things that are seen, Paul says, are transient. They're changing. But the things that are seen are eternal. And here's what I know about my existence versus Winnie Kate's current existence. My life is transient. My life is full of things that will blow to and fro. The Lord will order our steps, will endure all sorts of things, Lord willing. Will endure joys and gladness and sadness. But Winnie Kate, not a tear in the world. Not a, not a question about what am I missing on earth. Not a wonder about any of it. She sees Christ in full. And I'm jealous. And, and Lord willing, Lord willing, I'll go to her one day. And it'll be a beautiful reunion. But until then, I cannot look back at Egypt, at my suffering, and want to stay there. I've got to press on because the things that are unseen, those truths that lie ahead, those are eternal. Amen? That's my reality. And so James gives a beautiful illustration of what he's trying to say. He says, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Now, you and I, these days, we just wait on Walmart to put it on the shelf for us. We get mad when it ain't there, right? We're upset. I know they didn't leave this out of my pickup today, right? I see y'all on Facebook. I know who you are. <laughs> That's called grumbling, by the way. We'll get to it in a moment. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. I love what James is doing here. It, it's beautiful and it stings a lot. <laughs> Consider the farmer who awaits a crop of corn, he might say. He depends on the rain. Who controls the rain? God. He endures the storms. Who controls the storms? God. Who controls the droughts when he's waiting for rain? God. Eventually, though, his patience rewards him with a new crop, doesn't it? And the question then has to be, as I look at the farmer who waits for the precious fruit of the earth, just merely something to be eaten, something to help sustain life, a gift, no doubt. Will we not patiently wait for a crown of glory then? 
Will we not endure these storms of life, these providential afflictions with patience as we await our heavenly homeland and the eternal reward that goes with it? Will we not wait? What else then is worthy of such patience? Will a farmer show more patience than God's people? I hope not. Brothers and sisters, I urge you to join me in patience, waiting on the coming of the Lord and the eternal reward that He will bring to us. Amen? A fixed gaze on eternity is the key to immovable patience in suffering. The second command that we see here is establish your heart. In verse 8, James writes, you also be patient. Just as the farmer was, you be patient. How? Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. You see, he grounds it again in your looking forward to the coming of Christ. Establish your heart in faith and patience as you await the coming of the Lord. And that coming of the Lord is a doctrine that if you'll believe it, if if you'll truly believe that Christ is going to return as King of kings and Lord of lords, it can have a tremendous effect on your outlook during suffering. And so he now adds to it, be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Faith in God and patience in His providence will establish your heart. Matthew Henry, the Bible commentator, pastor, said this in his commentary. He says, let your faith be firm without wavering. Your patient, I'm sorry, your practice of what is good, constant and continued, without tiring, and your resolutions for God and heaven fixed in spite of all sufferings. Isaiah 50 verse 7 says this, says, but the Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced, therefore I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. This is what it means to be steadfast. In Matthew chapter 7, as Jesus is, Jesus is finishing up his Sermon on the Mount, he raises a warning for his listeners there at the end of, of his sermon. It's really his call to action. In verse 24, he, he says this, he says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And then he continues, and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. This is what it means to establish your hearts. It it means that you are making a conscious decision to build your house on the rock of Christ Jesus, on His Word, that you are choosing in your suffering to erect a base, a foundation for your home that is the Word of God alone. You're not looking for worldly wisdom. You're not looking for quaint sayings. You're not looking for any of that nonsense. You are saying that the only thing that will stand the test of time, the only thing that will never be undone, The only thing that will last forever is the Word of Christ, and I'm going to stand on it. I'm going to stand there on it. And let me tell you, when the rains come and the flood rises and the winds beat against your faith, you'll topple some, you'll move, you'll sway back and forth at times, you'll feel rocked. much like a fighter who gets knocked around a bit in the early rounds. But if you'll stand on the Word of God, 
you will not fall. You will not fall. This is about living a life of readiness and not laziness. It's about proactively saying each day, I'm going to establish my heart on the Word of God today. And I'm going to live it. I'm, I'm going to fast from everything. I'm going to get rid of things. I'm going to take things out of my life until I know that I have firmly planted myself on Christ. And then I may add some things here and there. I strongly encourage you to establish your hearts on the Word of Christ before suffering comes and knocks at your door so that during your suffering, you have already formed good habits. You've already built up some faith. You've already walked through some struggles and come out on the other side. You are like David and saying, wait, Saul, you don't understand. I've beat a lion and a bear, and no one is going to mock our God. I'll fight him. And you stand with faith. Patricia and I recognize now, I think, we, we've had some conversations around this anyway over the last several weeks, but we, we recognize that the Lord has been preparing us over the last 14 years. We'll be married 14 years in a couple of weeks. He's been preparing us over this time for the day that He would take when He came. We didn't fully know the importance of building a habit of daily Bible reading or prayer for one another, with one another, prayer with our children, prayer on our own, what I just call dependent prayer, praying like a child who's dependent upon the Father. We, we didn't recognize how our growth and our knowledge of God and His character through reading His Word, studying His Word over the last 14 years, how it would impact our lives so much as we endure such heartache. But I'll tell you this, it became crystal clear to me that I married correctly in the first moments of Winnie's passing. The Lord comforted us with Scriptures that the Holy Spirit would bring to our remembrance. Songs, prayers, memories of His goodness in those six years with her. And this wasn't preacher Kyle pleading with his wife to, babe, we've got to have faith. you just got to hold on. You know, like, there was none of that. I don't, I don't stand before you even today as like preacher Kyle, you know, trying to say all the right things to you today. That One, I don't want to be phony. <laughs> but two, it would do you no good. But as I'm sitting there holding Patricia's hand and praise God for Daniel and Morgan, we were on a trip with them and when we learned all this and um, Daniel drove us home, we were in New Orleans when it all happened, Daniel drove us home. And, and so I'm just sitting in the back seat and we're crying, pleading with the Lord. And, and Patricia just looks up at me through her tears and she says, it's that verse in Job. And then she goes on to say it, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And this isn't to celebrate Patricia. It's really not. I, I'm, she's worthy of my celebration, I promise you. This is what Proverbs 31 says, when her husband rises and calls her blessed. That I'll do it every day. It's to celebrate what the Lord 
has done in our lives through all of this. And I, I just can't think of a better reason to establish your heart in faith and patience than to know that suffering is coming. And you know, we say it all the time that one out of one dies, unless your name's Enoch or Elijah. <laughs> and even if it was your name, you're probably not getting out like they did, so you're still going to die. <laughs> Unless we're fortunate enough to see the return of Christ. But one out of one people suffer also. One out of every one suffers, even Enoch and Elijah. You're not getting out of life in a fallen world without experiencing suffering. You're not going to serve Christ as your Lord without going through suffering. Which is not going to happen. You will suffer for the name of the Lord, either in persecution or by some other aspect of the providence of God. Because in your suffering, your faith is tested, and the tested genuineness of your faith is like gold going through a refiner, Peter says. And so the Lord is kind to us in providentially granting us suffering. At the end of Philippians 1, Paul tells the believers this. He says, it has been granted to us that we will both suffer and believe. Granted to us from the Lord that you will suffer and believe. But even if you haven't yet faced suffering, even if suffering comes first, even if you haven't yet established yourself and suffering hits you, that thing, whatever it is, may be the thing that finally hurls you over the edge of self-reliance. Maybe you've constructed a sandcastle, and now the winds and the rains of suffering, according to the providence of God, have demolished it. Is it too late? To establish your heart on Christ in that moment? Not a chance. Not a chance. That may be its intended purpose. Maybe the grace of the Lord coming to you. I've had many people come to me and say, my sin blank was found out. I'm embarrassed. I'm hurt. And I've learned to look those, mostly it's men, in the eye and say, I know you can't see it yet. It's hard to understand in this moment, but this is the grace of the Lord on your life. He's bringing you back. If you'll humble yourself, if you will not harden your heart, if you will humble yourself and submit to Him, make Him Lord of your life. You'll know his peace, his joy. And so crying out to him in your despair may be the beginning of establishing your heart on his word. In Psalm 121, the psalmist says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. In Psalm 109, 26, the psalmist writes, Help me, O Lord my God. Save me according to your steadfast love. In Psalm 44, 26, Rise up, come to our help, he says to God. Redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. I have gone back to such prayers time and time again in the last 11 weeks. When despair rises in my heart and in my mind, when agony takes my breath away, I have called to God, Lord, help me. Save me according to your steadfast love. The Lord has been so kind to show new depths of His love, His care, His mercy, His grace, His peace. His hope through all of this as we've called to Him. He always answers our cries. 
I do not want anyone to know the pains of suffering, though it is inevitable in this world. But what I do want every believer to know, what I want every believer to experience, is the depths of the love of God in the midst of your suffering. To find yourself in suffering and be able to trust that God is there. It's incomprehensible at times, and it's incomparable to anything else in the world. His love transcends your suffering. He is near to you in the midst of it. Psalm 23, 4, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. For you are with me, David writes. Your rod, your staff. They comfort me. That's what awaits the one who will establish his heart in the Lord. The comfort of God in the middle of your suffering. A fixed gaze on eternity is the key to immovable patience in suffering. All right, let's, let's at least get to three verses in here. James 5, 9, do not grumble. Third command we see. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Grumbling in the middle of suffering is a huge temptation. And the kind of grumbling that goes against your neighbor is twofold here. When he says, do not grumble against one another, on one hand, it might be malicious grumbling. It may be outright grumbling against your brother or sister in the Lord. They've done something, and you're letting everybody know about it. Maybe they didn't even do anything, but you're letting everybody know about it. On the other hand, it may be that your grumbling causes a brother or sister to stumble in their faith. And so, therefore, it goes against them in that way, though you were not intentionally malicious. Now, this is the kind of grumbling that we're not usually aware of. We don't typically understand or even think through the effects of getting on Facebook and going on a rant about parenting, a shopping experience, a marriage struggle, a problem in your job. We don't think about the effects of that on our own faith in Christ as well as the effects of that on others' potential faith in Christ. And in so doing, you're tearing one another down. Whether your grumbling is perfectly, uh, sorry, purposefully against your neighbor or merely causing them to stumble, James is saying you must not grumble at all. Don't be a grumbler. You will receive God's judgment for your grumbling against others. Now, I think there's various kinds of grumbling that you must avoid. Like to, So let's just bring this into a bit of a clearer picture so that we understand what we mean. There are murmuring grumbles, which is where you complain about what happens to you. And so it's important for you to remember that nothing comes to you apart from God's providence. So do not grumble about the events of your life. So what? The pickup took longer than you thought. So what? The fast food employee didn't get your order right. A lady ahead of you in line wanted to write a check, and it took a while. (laughs) Some of the ones that are the hardest to hear, especially now, is just parents grumbling about their children. That's hard. You need to be careful of how you think about your children. You you need to be careful of the things you say 
of expressing all of your feelings. Just because we feel something doesn't mean it's right to express it. Sometimes it's sinful to express it. Oftentimes it's sinful. This isn't to guilt trip anyone, I promise. It's, it's just that one stings a little extra right now. It's something Patricia and I have always said, Lord, help us not to be grumblers about our children. Uh, your children are a gift from the Lord. The Bible literally calls them a heritage from God. They're an incredible opportunity for you to leave a legacy of Christ-likeness if you'll take the job seriously, if you'll commit yourself to it, if you'll give up worldly pursuits to be with your children. Where the time calls for it and it's right. And that's something for you and your, your family to decide. But murmuring grumbles are really bad. This is what the Israelites were guilty of. God, we're hungry. No, God, we don't want manna. We want meat. No, God, not that meat. That's too much meat. Uh, God, can we just go back to Egypt, please? Don't be a murmurer. James is literally saying that you may be judged and the judge is standing at the door. You know, the Israelites were judged for their murmuring and were left out of the promised land because of it. So I encourage you strongly, be very careful about your murmuring. Distrustful grumbles are another kind. And if you're the kind of person who grumbles about the events of your life, you're murmuring about things that happen to you, you're very quickly going to become the kind of person who grumbles about what might happen as well. And in so doing, you show a distrust for the Lord. I'll be honest with you. In this, I have a new fear of God. And I find myself wondering what else might the hand of providence bring to my life. And in that way, I, I fear Him in a healthy way, in a way that causes me to love Him more, in a way that draws me to Him and rather than turns me away from Him. But I do. I have a new, healthy fear for the Lord. There are revengeful grumbles. This may show up in threats against the ones who have caused your sufferings. If he cuts me off again in line, I tell you what, I'm going right? to... Be careful not to take vengeance into your own hands. It looks great in movies, right? We, we love the movie of the guy who's exacting revenge. He's taking judgment into his own hands. But it's unbiblical at times. Be careful not to take vengeance into your hands. Vengeance belongs to the Lord alone, we're reminded in Romans 12. Remember, the judge stands at the door. He's coming soon. He sees all evil, and it will pay. He'll punish the wicked. He will redeem the righteous. Be found among the righteous. There are envious grumbles as well. As you look around and see others who are not suffering like you are, you may be tempted to grumble from envy. Why has this happened to me while the wicked seem to prosper? Be careful of that sort of heart. Learn to accept what the Lord brings to your life, to be content in it and to follow Him. The, the point that James is making is that you are to be patient to establish your heart, not to grumble against one another. Do not make one another uneasy by your groaning, which brings grief to those around you. Endure your hardship with an eye to heaven. Await the return of Christ. Trust God's providence. Believe that the God of all comfort will comfort you in the meantime. Remember the Lord, the judge, is at the door. Consider Him who sets all things right by His righteous judgment and redemption. Be patient, therefore, establish your heart. 
We only bring more problems on ourselves when we become grumblers. If we will avoid these evils, if we will be patient, then God will not condemn us. Let such considerations as I've given you today examine, cause you to examine your affections, your thoughts, your actions. Commit yourself to live according to Philippians 2.14 where Paul writes, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Is everybody okay? I'm really at a crossroads here. <laughs> I, uh, I, <laughs> I want to keep going. And I probably should. Can I finish with consider your examples? (laughs) I love that three of you feel that way, but there's a lot more of you in here. Some of you might not be as vocal as others. I'll, I'll, I'll give that. So maybe half of you want to keep going. Half of you are like, no, I'm really hungry. I just came to watch the baptism. Can I go home? Um, I didn't know what I was signing up for today. I apologize. You know, It's the old bait and switch. Um, let me finish with consider your examples. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My wife... Scarlett, you're usually so supportive. (laughs) I don't even know what to do now. The fourth command he gives, the fourth command he gives is consider your examples. Consider your examples. And, And this is... For me, this is the, the icing. I mean, this is, this is gold. <laughs> James 5, 10 through 11. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. And so James is saying, listen, do you want help in your sufferings? Do you want encouragement in your sufferings? Do you want hope that transcends all momentary affliction? And they're saying, "Uh (laughs) uh-huh. He says, consider those faithful Christians who have gone before you. Man, the Scriptures pour forth with story after story of men and women who endured great suffering unto the glory of God and the good of others. Throughout history, we celebrate those men and women who have remained steadfast during their sufferings. We consider them blessed. Those who suffer well become our examples of immovable patience and suffering. We look to them and we say, sometimes we'll just say, wow. James encourages the saints to look back. And the beauty of this is, is having been 2,000-ish years removed from when this was written, we have 2,000 years removed of more history to look back upon. And another beauty is when we look back through years of history, we're simply reading the stories that have been written down for us to see. But I can look around this room and could call out story after story of men and women in this room who have stood faithful in their suffering. 
And so what we have are thousands, if not millions even, of stories we could read. But beyond that, we have the stories that were never even written down, that we're fortunate to see because we're near to those in their suffering. Like I said, everyone suffers. And so there's a lot of stories of steadfastness and suffering that you can look at. And you can consider those people blessed. And so he's encouraging the saints. He's saying, look back to the prophets. Look back to Job. See those who stood for the name of the Lord. See their suffering and their patience and be encouraged to remain steadfast just as they did. Now what's happening here is really two things are going on. On one level, and I would say it's more of the surface level thing, James is saying, be steadfast like those who have gone before. Because the steadfast are considered blessed. It's the whole, when you see a model of something that you want to be, you try to emulate it, right? You try to become like that. And this is what he's saying. Look at those who have stood steadfast. We consider them blessed. Be like them. And that's a real motivating factor in suffering to run the race well. Time and time again, I've just poured over the Scriptures. I, my Bible reading has, for the year has had me in the prophets, and so I've just seen one after another the steadfastness of the prophets in the last 11 weeks. And it's encouraged me. We should want to be considered blessed by the saints around us as well as by our God and our Savior, Christ. However, on another level, and this is where I think the anchor lies. Like I think on one hand, it's pursue this because this is what it means to be blessed. And on the other hand, he anchors it in truth. It's not just look to them. It's again, he's saying, look to God. There's an encouragement here to remain steadfast because of the purpose and the character of the Lord. What did he say? You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, but don't miss this part, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. There it is. That's the anchor. That's the anchor for your soul in the midst of stormy waters. I, I hope that you see it clearly. James is anchoring his motivation for steadfastness, not only in the examples, but to remember the anchor that the examples had themselves. That is the providence of God. Now, providence is just simply the purposes of the Lord, which are always good. They're full of mercy and compassion. In other words, what he's saying is that nothing happens apart from God's merciful and compassionate rule. In Job 1.21, Job says this at the beginning of his suffering. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job 2 verse 10 but he said to her, to his wife, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. I praise God I don't have Job's wife. I've got basically Job for my wife, a lot prettier and female. But, but he says to his wife, because she was telling him, curse God and die. You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil also? And then it says this of Job, and all this Job did not sin with his lips. In Proverbs 16, 4, we read this. The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Now, there are naysayers out there concerning God's providence, believe it or not. <laughs> they will accuse people like myself. And like you, if you are a believer in the providence of God, they will accuse you of succumbing to, typically they use the words fatalism or determinism. 
And I don't have much time to get into all of those things. I don't really have any time. We've already established that. All right, Scarlett? <laughs> but, but here's some quick definitions. Determinism says that everything happens by some impersonal force in nature and that that cannot be overcome. So everything comes to us by some impersonal force of nature and there's nothing you can do to stop it. Nature causes a response, which we would call an effect, and therefore nature rules and we can't do anything to stop it. That view is a form of idolatry. Nature is God. Nature is God. Fatalism says that all things are predetermined by blind, irrational forces. So there is no point in human effort to change anything. This view results in the creation of a somewhat similar false god, but a bit different, and we would call that god fate. You hear phrases like, as fate would have it, or fate brought this person to my life. Both views, fatalism, determinism, are satanic counterfeits to the revealed truth of God's Word that our all-knowing, all-powerful, all-present God has planned all things according to the counsel of His own wisdom and His own will, which James says here is merciful and compassionate toward His people. Psalm 100 verse 5 says that the Lord is good and His love endures to all generations. Romans 8, 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to His purpose. Genesis 50, 20, Joseph looking at his brothers after all that he had gone through. If you've been in Sunday school, you know what I'm talking about. And he says this to them, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. And then he, James here just uses Job. Consider Job, the steadfastness of Job. I love when the text gives me my illustrations and I don't have to come up with them. I'm terrible at it. Job endured great loss at the hand of God. He went to God with his questions and he got some responses he wasn't quite ready for. When God says to you, dress for action like a man, you know you're in for it. <laughs> but God was merciful and compassionate in his response. This wasn't one of those like come to Jesus meetings like your parents had with you when you were a child, you know, and Jesus was never even in the conversation, right? <laughs> it was just you almost got to meet Jesus, right? This wasn't one of those moments. In their exchange, he walks away having seen the merciful and compassionate purposes of God. I loved when Patricia was up here earlier and she just said, I, I have known about him before, but now I have seen him. I've known about his goodness before, but now I have seen his goodness. What a testimony. In Job 42, Job says this, and Job answered the Lord, and if Golly, if you haven't read the end of Job, you have your assignment for today. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. It's something I've had to remind myself of often, that Winnie Kate's passing was not in some way God being thwarted in a moment. It wasn't a lapse of His goodness. It'd be easy to think that. It'd be easy to think that God got busy, that He forgot that He's all present. He decided He wasn't going to be all powerful in a moment, that He wasn't going to be all knowing, and He just missed on Winnie Kate. But God didn't miss on Winnie Kate. Just like He doesn't miss in your suffering and in your pain and in your trial, your struggle. Those things come to you as a result of the goodness of God. 
He means for something good to come out of it. And that's what Job's saying. I know that there is no purpose of yours which can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you make it known to me. That's what God had said to Job, and now Job's repeating it back. And he's saying, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job suffered well, and the Lord proved he is compassionate and merciful. He allowed Job to see new depths to God. And then after that, he returns everything to Job, even doubling it. But let's not forget that Job still, I mean, if I had lost possessions, that's one thing. And Job lost a lot of possessions. But losing a daughter is a completely different. Job lost multiple children. And though things were doubled, he still dealt with the loss of his children. But he was still able to say that the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Before I had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. This is what providence does. We could recall the names of many men and women in our Bibles, examine their stories. We would see that they endured suffering for the glory of the Lord and the good of others. And we call them blessed for it. While the Scriptures speak highly of those men and women, you can read Hebrews 11 if you're curious. There is one greater... There's one greater to whom we must look to as our example. Hebrews 11, we call the hall of faith. The writer of Hebrews takes us through example after example of those who endured hardship and exercised faith. He praises them and he even mentions there's so many we could name and we're not naming them all because he was running out of time also. And then in chapter 12, immediately after he says that, he says, Therefore, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and every sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder of and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The only perfect man to ever live endured suffering, was well acquainted with grief. You're not alone in it. Look to Christ. Look to Christ. The best way to suffer with immovable patience is to look to Christ and to the end of your sufferings. Once God's purposes for your suffering are answered, He brings an end to them. And His mercy is such that He carries with Him an abundant reward for all their sufferings. That is an unfading crown of glory for all who call on the name of Christ. Matthew Henry said this, he said, God's bowels, that is his inward parts, they wrote different back then, right? God's bowels are moved for them while suffering. You're like, mine are moved every time I eat Mexican, but (laughs) God's bowels are moved for them while suffering. His bounty is manifested afterwards. John chapter 11, verse 33 Jesus is responding to a call to come because Lazarus has passed. It says, when Jesus saw her weeping, the sister of Lazarus, he saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping. So there's a a throng of weeping going on. Listen to how he was moved. It says he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Greatly troubled. And then in verse 35, two verses later, we read, shortest verse in all of Scripture, Jesus wept. Short verse, 
massive impact. What are, we, what are we saying? Christ looks on death and weeps. Christ looks on death and said, this is not the way things are supposed to be. And now you know a little bit more about the joy that was set before him. It was the redemption of his people. It was the redemption of the world. It was to set all things right one day when Christ returns. And so the only way, brothers and sisters, that you're going to have immovable patience is to fix your gaze on eternity. Fix your gaze there. Look to Christ. Be patient. Establish your heart. Do not grumble. Consider your examples. See them. See their stories. See their God who abounds in steadfast love and faithfulness. Let their example and their character that you see in God, let that character spur you on during your sufferings. His purposes are always compassionate and merciful. Even if you cannot yet see it that way, hold on. Be patient. Remember that the hope of Christ is with you. And it will not put you to shame, just as it did not put our examples in Scripture to shame either. So brothers and sisters, I'll leave you with this. Let us serve our God. Let us endure our trials as those who believe that the end of all things will crown all of God's people. Amen. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, It's a joy to be in your house today. I praise you for the patience of this people today, their encouragement, their allowing me to preach your word today. It is my hope, Lord, that we will know immovable patience in our time of suffering. Lord, I thank you for the grace and the mercy that you have shown to my wife and our boys and myself, to Winnie's grandparents and family members, to her church family and her friends. Lord, we would be lost without you. I thank you, Lord, that we get to grieve as people with hope. We get to look to Christ always. We get to trust, Lord, that your providential hand orders all things for our good. Even if we can't quite see it, we trust that it's true because your word has spoken and your word is true. Lord, may the saints here today be edified, encouraged, strengthened by your word. May we go from this place now into the world to proclaim the gospel of Christ, to live for you, to love you, and to love others as you show us. May we honor your name in all that we say and do. Forgive us of our sins, Lord. Help us to be honest today in our evaluation of ourselves, to be repentant. If we have failed you, if we have failed to obey your word, Lord, we thank you that you are faithful even when we are not. Praise you, Father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.